from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The sentence rendered today is the longest received by a defendant for an unauthorized disclosure of national defense information to the media. NSA whistleblower reality winner has been sentenced to more than five years in prison for leaking a top-secret document to The Intercept about Russian interference in the 2016 election. We'll speak to Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist James Risen of The Intercept, journalist Kevin Gastola, and reality's mother, Billy Winner Davis. Say her name. I want everybody to know who Reality Winner is and what is happening to Reality Winner. Um, it's very, very important that she be remembered and that people not forget what she is going through, the battle that she faces, that she is being silenced, that she is being hidden away, she is locked away. Then we go to Connecticut, where a Bangladeshi woman facing deportation has been granted a last-minute stay following public outcry. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Yemen, Houthi rebels and local journalists say U.S.-backed Saudi-led coalition airstrikes targeted a camp for civilians displaced by the war Thursday, killing 31 people, including 22 children. The reported bombing struck the camp about 12 miles outside the Red Sea port city of Hodeida, which came under assault by the Saudi-led coalition over the summer. State media for the United Arab Emirates disputes news of the attack, claiming a missile fired by Houthi rebels killed one child and injured dozens more. The latest deaths came exactly two weeks after a bomb produced by the U.S. weapons maker Lockheed Martin and sold by the United States to Saudi Arabia killed 51 people, 40 of them schoolchildren. This week, the Senate rejected an amendment by Connecticut Democrat Senator Chris Murphy that would have restricted U.S. financial aid and other support for the Saudi led bombing campaign. Executives at the National Enquirer kept a safe holding documents detailing hush money payments and other damaging stories the tabloid killed as part of a cozy relationship with Donald Trump ahead of the 2016 presidential election. That's according to the Associated Press, which reports the executives emptied the safe after Donald Trump's election victory. It's not known whether the documents were preserved. The revelation came as it emerged that David Pecker, chairman and CEO of the Inquirer's parent company, American Media Inc., was granted immunity by federal prosecutors as they billed a case against Trump's personal lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen. David Pecker has been a close friend of Donald Trump for decades. His cooperation with federal prosecutors raises the prospect of new information about Trump's past behavior. Michael Cohen admitted in court Tuesday President Trump directed him to illegally pay out money to two women to keep them from speaking during the 2016 campaign about their alleged affairs with Donald Trump. The payments involved the National Enquirer, which acquired exclusive rights to the stories and refused to publish them in a process known as catch and kill. Meanwhile, The New York Times reports Manhattan's district attorney's office may bring criminal charges against the Trump organization and two senior company officials over hush money payments. Any convictions on New York state charges would not be subject to a presidential pardon. This all comes as New York's attorney general has opened a new criminal inquiry into whether Michael Cohen violated state tax laws. President Trump has renewed his attacks on Jeff Sessions, blasting the attorney general by his first name in a tweet storm this morning after telling Fox News in an interview that aired Thursday he never would have hired Sessions if Trump had known Sessions would recuse himself from oversight over the Robert Mueller investigation. Sessions recused himself, which he shouldn't have done, or he should have told me. Even my enemies say that Jeff Sessions should have told you that he was going to recuse himself and then you wouldn't have put him in. He took the job and then he said, I'm going to recuse myself. I said, what kind of a man is this? 
After those remarks aired on Fox News, a pair of senior Republican senators signaled they're open to having President Trump fire Attorney General Sessions. South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who also serves on the judiciary, told reporters it was very likely Trump would nominate a new attorney general after the midterm elections. And I think there will come a time, sooner rather than later, where it will be time to have a uh, new face and a fresh voice at the Department of Justice. Clearly, uh, Attorney General Sessions doesn't have the confidence of the president, and the president has a right to have an attorney general he feels comfortable with. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Charles Grassley went a step further Thursday, telling Bloomberg News he'd be able to make time for hearings for a new attorney general this fall. Attorney General Sessions fired back Thursday, writing in a statement, While I am attorney general, the actions of the Department of Justice will not be improperly influenced by political considerations. In California, Republican Congressmember Duncan Hunter and his wife, Margaret Hunter, pleaded not guilty Thursday to federal charges they misused a quarter of a million dollars of campaign funds for personal expenses, including expensive vacations and their children's school tuition. Speaking on Fox News, Congressmember Hunter appeared to blame his wife for the expenditures. She was also the, the, camp, the campaign manager, so what, whatever she did on that, that'll be uh, that'll be looked at too, I'm sure. But uh, but I didn't do it. I, I didn't spend any money illegally. Hunter was the second member of Congress to endorse candidate Donald Trump in 2016. His indictment on campaign finance violations came just weeks after the first Congress member to endorse Trump, Chris Collins of New York, suspended his campaign for election after he was indicted on charges of insider trading. Prisoners are striking around the country as part of a nationwide protest demanding improved living conditions, greater access to resources, and the end of what prisoners are calling modern-day slavery. In Tacoma, Washington, immigrant rights advocates say 60 immigrants detained at the Northwest Detention Center continued their hunger strike Thursday. California prisoner Eroberto Garcia is also hunger striking at New Folsom State Prison. He recorded video of himself refusing food in a cell that was then posted on Twitter. Meanwhile, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, protesting prisoners issued a statement in solidarity with the U.S. prison strike. The statement said the prisoners were, quote, warehoused as inmates not treated as human beings. Organizers also report actions in North and South Carolina, Georgia and Florida, as the national prison strike moves into its fourth day. This comes as 10 prisoners have died behind bars in Mississippi this month. Activists and family members are demanding answers for the spike in prisoner deaths. The IWW's Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee tweeted about the deaths, quote, why hashtag prison strike? Because at this point, it's about survival. NSA whistleblower reality winner was sentenced Thursday to five years and three months in prison, the longest sentence ever imposed in federal court for leaking government information to the media. 26-year-old reality winner is the first person to be sentenced under the Espionage Act since President Trump took office. Winner was arrested by FBI agents at her home in Augusta, Georgia, June 3, 2017, two days before The Intercept published an expose revealing Russian military intelligence conducted a cyber attack on at least one U.S. voter software company just days before the U.S. presidential election uh, in November of 2016. After headlines, we'll speak with reality winner's mother, along with James Risen, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, and uh, Kevin Gostela. All were in the courtroom yesterday. In Hawaii, there are reports of landslides and heavy flooding as Hurricane Lane grazes the archipelago as a Category 3 storm. More than two feet of rain has fallen in some parts of the Big Island as the storm tracks slowly towards smaller, more populous islands to the north. South African officials have rejected a tweet by President Trump alleging the wide-scale killing of white farmers by South Africa's black majority. Amidst mounting scandals related to the Russia probe Tuesday night, President Trump tweeted, I have asked Secretary of State Sek Pompeo to closely study the South Africa land and farm seizures and expropriations and the large-scale killing of farmers, unquote. Former KKK Grand Wizard David Duke and the far-right anti-immigrant website vdare.com retweeted the president, along with messages about, quote, white genocide. 
The South African government tweeted in response, South Africa totally rejects this narrow perception, which only seeks to divide our nation and reminds us of our colonial past, the South African government tweeted. Trump made his original tweet Tuesday night, right after a Fox News report on South Africa. In Australia, conservative Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has been ousted after a bruising leadership fight within the ruling Liberal Party. Treasurer Scott Morrison will replace Turnbull as the country's newest prime minister. Morrison is a social conservative who, like Malcolm Turnbull, is known for his support for Australia's harsh anti-immigrant policies. He's also a prominent opponent of efforts to curb catastrophic climate change. In 2017, Morrison brought a lump of coal to the floor of the Australian parliament, mocking opposition lawmakers with the words, don't be afraid, don't be scared, it won't hurt you, it's coal, unquote. Scott Morrison becomes prime minister as human-induced global warming has brought soaring temperatures and wildfires to Australia, along with the continent's worst drought in living memory. Back in the United States, climate justice groups are blasting the fossil fuel industry over an effort to secure billions of taxpayer dollars to protect coastal infrastructure from climate change. The plan would create a massive spine of seawalls to protect dozens of coastal refineries from encroaching seas and ever more powerful storms. Texas alone has requested $12 billion for the project. In response, Jamie Henn of 350.org tweeted, Let me get this straight. Big Oil is asking taxpayers to pay for protecting their refineries from sea level rise that they cause by keeping us addicted to oil. Yeah, no, he tweeted. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos is considering a plan that would grant federal funds to states to purchase firearms for teachers and school employees. The New York Times reports the plan would use federal student support and academic enrichment grants to pay for guns to tra as well as training for educators in their use. The plan would reverse longstanding federal policy prohibiting federal funds for arming educators. And Pope Francis heads to the Republic of Ireland this weekend, where a half-million Catholic faithful are expected to line the streets of Dublin to catch a glimpse of the first visit by a pontiff to Ireland in four decades. Francis is scheduled to meet victims of clerical sexual and physical abuse. The pope's visit comes less than two weeks after a grand jury in Pennsylvania reported more than 300 Catholic priests sexually abused a thousand children and possibly thousands more over seven decades, and that church leadership covered up the abuse. This is Irish journalist and broadcaster Pat Coyle. That wound is deep in the psyche now of the Irish people, and it brings up that pain. We want, people want the survivors to be able to meet the Pope. They want the Pope to be able to say something really meaningful, not just sorry. I think people have heard sorry an awful lot. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. NSA whistleblower reality winner has been sentenced to five years and three months in prison, the longest sentence ever imposed in federal court for leaking government information to the media. The 26-year-old reality winner is the first person to be sentenced under the Espionage Act since President Trump took office. Her sentencing Thursday came after she pleaded guilty in June to transmitting a top-secret document to a news organization. She'd faced up to 10 years in prison. This is Bobby Christine, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Georgia, speaking after winner sentencing. The sentence rendered today is the longest received by a defendant for an unauthorized disclosure of national defense information to the media. It appropriately satisfies the need for both punishment and deterrence in light of the nature and seriousness of the offense. Winner's purposeful violation put our nation's security at risk. She claimed to hate America when asked, you don't really hate America right? She responded, I mean, yeah, I do. It's literally the worst thing to happen on the planet. She was the quintessential example of an insider threat.
Reality Winner was arrested by FBI agents at her home in Augusta, Georgia, June 3, 2017, two days before The Intercept published an expose revealing Russian military intelligence and conducted a cyber attack on at least one U.S. voting software company just days before the U.S. presidential election in 2016. The expose was based on a classified NSA report from May 5, 2017, that shows the agency is convinced the Russian General Staff Main Intelligence Directorate, or GRU, was responsible for interfering in the 2016 16 presidential election. Earlier this morning, President Trump tweeted about the case, saying, quote, ex-NSA contractor to spend 63 months in jail over classified information. Gee, this is small potatoes compared to what Hillary Clinton did. So unfair, Jeff, double standard. He was referring to Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who he has been attacking over the last 24 hours. For more, we're joined by three guests who were in the courtroom Thursday during Reality Winner sentencing. Joining us via Democracy Now! video stream is Billy Winner Davis, mother of Reality Lee Winner. She's joining us from Augusta, where Reality Winner was sentenced. In Atlanta, Georgia, Kevin Gastola is managing editor of Shadowproof Press. He's been covering Reality's case and has covered several whistleblower trials, including that of Chelsea Manning. He was in the courtroom on Wednesday. And in Washington, D.C., James Horizon is with us, The Intercept senior national security correspondent, a best-selling author and a former New York Times reporter, also serves as director of First Look Media's Press Freedom Defense Fund. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Uh, let's begin with reality's mother, uh, Billy Winner Davis. You were in the courtroom with your daughter. Can you explain your—can you share your reaction to her plea deal and sentencing? Well, um... I think yesterday, my initial reaction to the whole proceeding and the judge's sentencing was I was relieved that the judge did approve of the plea agreement that the parties had reached for the 63 months in prison and with a three-year supervised release. Um, today, I'm a little bit bitter. I'm a little angry. No, I should say I'm a lot bitter today. Just um, processing it, knowing that she is going to be serving the longest prison sentence for this, hearing um, Mr. Christine's comments about her, hearing, um, you know, again, that she has to be the deterrent for anyone else in America who would think of warning us, of blowing the whistle on something important like this. Um, it's just, it's, it's really hard. It's hard as her mother to have to experience this and to know that she's going to be the one who is going to set the example. She's that, that first leaker under Trump's administration. She's the first one that they intended to nail to the door as a message to others. And can you share reality's statement yesterday before the judge? Reality um, had a pretty lengthy statement that she had worked on. Um, she basically, she let the judge know a little bit about who she was. Um, she did share with the court that she was grateful for the professionalism that everyone had shown to her, the respectful environment. She let the court know, you know, a little bit about who she was, why she went in to serve her country. She basically um, went through her childhood, uh, her relationship with her father, um, how 9-11 had affected her as a child, how she followed her stepbrother's footsteps to go into the Air Force to be a linguist. She wanted to serve her country. She really had the desire to uh, protect and defend and serve her country. I think she was trying to, you know, um, let the court know that Although in some state, statements with texting with her sister, she did indicate that she hates America, that that's not really who she was. And so she was really letting the court know a little bit about herself. She also apologized to the court. She apologized to the government for uh, the breach of trust. She apologized to the court and the government for the expense that she has cost them. She apologized to her family. Um, she indicated that she knew that what she had done was wrong. She indicated that um, she was willing to um, 
accept responsibility and willing to move forward and accept the consequences of her actions. How long has she been in jail, Billy? He's been in jail for about 15 months. Will that be part is will time served be part of that five more than five years in jail? Yes, it's my understanding that that time served will count toward her sentence day for day. When she came into the courtroom, you heard her shackles. Yes, that was that was really difficult. That's the first time that um, we've heard that, I think, because Typically, she's been in the courtroom downstairs, and there's carpeting. You you know, you kind of hear her shuffle. But yesterday, it was very quiet when they brought her in, and when they she went up to the podium, you could actually hear her leg sh shackles hit the floor and make that clanking sound. Um, it's it's really striking that every time that reality has appeared in court, she has to wear the orange inmate jumpsuit. She is shackled. Um, she is very much um, presented as a criminal in that court. They, de they dehumanize her and, and they portray her as a criminal. Now, your daughter, Reality, will be incarcerated at the Federal Medical Center Carswell in Fort Worth, Texas. Why a medical center? That is only the recommendation at this time. That's the recommendation that her defense team is making for her, a recommendation that a psychiatrist is making for her. And, and the judge actually um, approved of that recommendation yesterday. Whether or not she's placed there, we won't know. That will be up to the Bureau of Prisons to decide. But we do feel like that um, facility will meet her needs. My daughter does suffer from severe depression. She does suffer from bulimia. Um, this entire situation with her being incarcerated, her inability to really um, control her environment has been very difficult on her. And we're hoping that she is placed there so that they can meet her needs and she can get the treatment that she needs. And did you speak to her? Were you able to communicate with her yesterday? Afterward, she, she called me when she was back at the jail. The defense team did ask the marshals if uh, we could be allowed, you know, a brief visit with her yesterday at the courthouse, and again, we were denied. Um, they make this request whenever they can, and again, the marshals will not permit us to be in the same room with her. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. We're speaking to Billy Winner Davis. She is the mother of Reality Winner, who has just been sentenced to more than five years um, for um, releasing uh, intelligence, leaking a top secret document to The Intercept. When we come back, uh, in addition to um, Billy Winner Davis, we'll be joined by Jim Risen. He is now at The Intercept. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. He himself has uh, been prosecuted um, under the Obama administration, um, and we'll talk about that as well. And Kevin Gostel, a longtime reporter in the courtroom yesterday, he'll be speaking to us from Atlanta. Stay with us. The autumn took the rest, but it won't take me. I'm the last leaf on the tree. When the autumn wind blows, they've already gone. They flutter to the ground, cause they can hang on. And there's nothing in the world that I ain't seen. All of the new ones that are coming in green, and I'm the last leaf on the tree. The last leaf by Joan Baez. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're talking about the latest on NSA whistleblower, reality winner who's just been sentenced to more than five years, 63 months in prison, the longest sentence ever imposed in federal court for leaking government information to the media. 
Reality winner is 26. She's the first person to be sentenced under the Espionage Act since President Trump took office. Her sentencing came Thursday, after she pleaded guilty in June to transmitting a top-secret document to a news organization. She had faced up to 10 years in prison. Our guests are uh, Reality's mom, Billy Winner Davis. We're also um, going to be speaking with Jim Risen of The Intercept, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. But first, right now, we're going to Kevin Gastola, who was in the courtroom yesterday. Kevin, this is the longest ever sentence um, uh, of this type. Please explain. Yes, and it should be emphasized that the Justice Department was quite gleeful about this accomplishment. And people should recognize that Reality Winner is going to jail for a single count under the Espionage Act. There have been other leak cases. And in most of those cases, the Justice Department has been able to charge those individuals with several offenses, multiple counts under the Espionage Act. In the case of Jeffrey Sterling, a CIA whistleblower, he was sentenced for, uh, I believe it was seven counts of violating the Espionage Act, ended up with a total of 42 months in prison. So just divide that up, and you can tell that's way less than five years for a single violation of the Espionage Act. John Kiriakou, CIA whistleblower, he had a plea agreement for 30 months and did time in federal prison. Um, and, and while that was for an Intelligence Identities Protection Act violation, he was prosecuted under the Espionage Act and eventually was able to bargain out a much, much lower and less severe sentence. So it does seem like this is extraordinary when you view Reality Winner's case. Mm. I want to turn to a statement from Betsy Reed, editor-in-chief of The Intercept, who wrote, "...the vulnerability of the American electoral system is a national topic of immense gravity, but it took Winner's act of bravery to bring key details of an attempt to compromise the democratic process in 2016 to public attention." Those same details were included in the July indictment of alleged Russian military intelligence operatives issued by special counsel Robert Mueller. Instead of being recognized as a conscience-driven whistleblower whose disclosure helped protect U.S. elections, Winner was prosecuted with vicious resolve, Betsy Reed wrote, again, editor-in-chief of The Intercept. We're going to go right now to Jim Risen who is a reporter now with The Intercept, The Intercept senior national security correspondent, best-selling author, and former New York Times reporter, also First Look Media's Press Freedom Defense Fund. He's director of that, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. Jim, you, too, were in the courtroom yesterday. Can you respond to the sentence that Reality Winner received? I think it was outrageous. Uh, I think what what has been done by the Trump administration to reality is a uh, is just terrible, and it's one of the worsting uh, miscarriages of justice I've seen in a long time. Uh, what reality winner did was a public service. The disclosure of the document in this that um, the Intercept published uh, was uh, it provided a really important wake-up call to the American people that the Russian, that Russian intelligence was hacking into the election systems of states. And the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, in a report earlier this year, wrote that the Homeland Security Department had failed to adequately warn state uh, election officials about the Russian hacking threat and said in their uh, in the Senate report, it said it was only because of press disclosures uh, that state officials began to be alerted to the Russian threat, uh, cyber threat, which shows that even Congress recognizes that what Reality Winner did was a public service. Uh, and so I think one of the things that um, we uh, at the Press Freedom Fund want to try to push uh, for is to try to get the government to stop using this draconian espionage act against whistleblowers in the way that they they uh, they have been. It's an archaic World War I era law that the government uses because it's so vague 
uh, that it's you can uh, charge almost anybody for anything, and it's not being used against spies anymore. It's only being used against people who actually talk to American reporters to reveal important matters. In a recent sentencing memorandum, prosecutors argued reality winner deserved the unprecedented sentence because, quote, the defendant's unauthorized disclosure caused exceptionally grave harm to our national security. Jim Rice, your response? That's just not true. Uh, even the, if you look at the uh, indictment of the 12 Russian intelligence operatives, Virtually the entire information in there is the same information made public in the uh, uh, or, or it was based on some of the same information that was in that um, NSA document. And the Mueller indictment reveals that the Russian intelligence operatives that were targeted in this indictment were already aware as of 12, uh, 2016 that the U.S. was investigating them. And that they were alerted to that, not by the uh, leak to the intercept, but by other actions taken by the U.S. government, and that the Russian official who was in charge of the uh, hacking of election systems in that Russian unit had taken steps in 2016 to protect himself from the uh, American intelligence, which shows that a year before— the, this document was published by The Intercept. Other actions had already been taken by the U.S. government to alert the Russians that the, they were being monitored by the United States, which gives the lie to the idea that somehow anything that we published at The Intercept had anything to do with alerting the Russians about the uh, American intelligence surveillance of them and shows that there was no damage caused by uh, this leak. Earlier this morning, Jim, President Trump tweeted, saying ex-NSA contractor should spend 63 months in jail over classified information. Gee, this is small potatoes compared to what Hillary Clinton did. So unfair, Jeff, double standard, of course, referring to Jeff Sessions, who he wants to oust as attorney general. What do you make of this tweet? Uh, because also, you could argue that this is a political attack on her because she was talking about Russian interference with the 2016 election, something President Trump doesn't like discussing. Well, first of all, Donald Trump is a psycho uh, and shouldn't be president. He's crazy. And so he tweets in the middle of the night about stuff he knows nothing about every day. So you have to discount this because of that. But he is correct that there is a double standard. It's just not a double standard with Hillary Clinton. The double standard is that low-level people in the intelligence community are—, are the ones who are prosecuted and not high-level people. If you look at the, the real double standard here is between what the way the Justice Department dealt with someone like David Petraeus, who was the CIA director, who leaked lots of information to his former mistress uh, and then was never sent to jail and was given probation, uh, and the way that they've this draconian sentence against a reality winner, which is an absurd double standard. That's the real double standard. The other thing I would say is that the thing that Trump doesn't want to admit is that he has politicized the Justice Department to such a degree that the two of the first three prosecutions of whistleblowers under his administration are about leaks of information about tr the Trump and Russia case, both in this case, uh, which involved the Russian inve the investigation of Russian election meddling, and in the case of uh, Jim Wolf, the Senate Intelligence Security Officer, who has been charged with uh, allegedly leaking information about Carter Page and the Russia investigation. So two out of three investigations are about matters that directly relate to Donald Trump and his campaign. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that the Justice Department has been highly politicized already on the, these kind of cases. So you have uh, Trump uh, tweeting uh, this, this comment um, uh, uh, about reality winner, talking about a double standard. Um, 
And then you have the fact that Trump could pardon her. In fact, once he tweeted this, this was the response in social media, um, talking about um, saying, OK, pardon her. How likely is this? Well, I think that would be great. I mean, that would show uh, a level of mercy that I, we haven't seen from Donald Trump, but I think that would be great um, if he does that. Uh, she shouldn't be in jail in the first place. Uh, she, what she did was a public service. So I, anything that can be done to help her, I'm all for. Kevin Gostola, you wrote a long piece earlier this week about how the government tried to break reality spirit. Can you explain? In a way, when she was arrested, you know, the FBI agents backed her into a corner in a back room of her home. They coerced a confession from her. They didn't read her her Miranda rights. She then, from that point, was immediately uh, put under this uh, model where you treat a person not like they're a leaker, not like they're someone who spoke to the press, but like they're a terrorist. Uh, she was denied bond immediately. The prosecutors were lying. Um, they fabricated claims based on alleged conversations between Reality Winner and her family members. They took texts out of context. It's important to note that that phrase about hating America came from a joke. Um, and so if we believe in freedom of speech or if we believe in reason, uh, they were deliberately di uh, misinterpreting or lying about uh, her views toward America. They made her as if she was somebody who was a Taliban sympathizer who wanted to go abroad and help people in the Middle East who would like to do this country harm. They took her Air Force service and turned it into something that was a negative aspect of her. And they used it to justify keeping her in prison and denying her bail, even though she committed a nonviolent offense. And there are people who have committed violent crimes who do not go to jail before they are convicted. From that point onward, she was kept in a county jail in Lincolnton County. And there she suffered a, an assault by a state inmate. She's a federal inmate, so she had to take this and lie down in the fetal position, and she couldn't fight back because she didn't want any additional charges to be added to her case. Um, onward, uh, whenever she wanted to go to the courthouse to work on her case, um, as Reality's mother has discussed, she was strip-searched um, very arbitrarily, not necessarily because they had suspicion that she's someone who would traffic contraband, but because that's just the way in which they wanted to show they had control over reality winner. And so you put someone in a situation where you wear them down when it comes to working on their own defense. You make it impossible for them to get subpoenas to put together a valid defense. You make it impossible for someone to put on a public interest defense to argue why they released the leak, to put on any kind of whistleblower defense. And then eventually you get the person to a point where they accept a plea deal because it's much better than going to prison for 10 years. You'll take five years with the possibility of getting out of jail soon. You listen to that description, your comments, and also talk about um, how this relates to your um, being head of the First Look Media's Press Freedom Defense Fund. Well, we uh, the Press Freedom Fund, we've been very proud to uh, help uh, fund uh, Reality's legal defense. Um, it's one of the first uh, cases that we funded uh, since I took over the uh, fund last fall. Uh, and it's, um, I think it's, a, it's a, a real good case for of press freedom, because what she did, or what she's alleged to have done, uh, as I said earlier, is a public service. And it, it really was one of the few uh, moments in the last year and a half where the American people got a clear warning that their election systems were being hacked by the Russians. It was no longer just a hack of uh, the Democratic uh, Committee's emails. This was a direct hack of the, of the American election system. The Russians were attempting to change voting patterns by getting into voting machines. And the United States government had failed to adequately warn anyone that that was going on until this document was released. The idea that that is somehow a bad thing is ridiculous. It's, it shows you how absurd 
and Kafkaesque this entire prosecution has become. And so we've been very proud to uh, help pay her legal defense. Mm. Has this case changed the way The Intercept receives um, documents? Um, the, w and explain what she pled to. She mailed a document. Um, she has said this is the case. Is that right? To The Intercept. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Explain Sam. what reality Winner has um, has pled to. She said she mailed a document to the Intercept that she had access to as an NSA contractor with this corporation, Pluribus. Um, uh, I think it's called Pluribus International um, Corporation right, right. in Augusta. It, it, right. And has it changed how the Intercept receives and then reveals documents, having placed that document then online, The Intercepted? Well, I think uh, I can't really discuss how we handle uh, things internally, but I think it's uh, safe to say that uh, this has been an important—this uh, was important for us because it really, uh, as I said, was a great, an important and great story. I think the idea that um, The Intercept, we, we received actually quite a bit of uh, anonymous information, and we continue to receive a lot of uh, um, documents and other information from a number of sources anonymously uh, and from people who are named. And so we're going to continue to always uh, try to deal with that in the best way possible. And um, I think we, we have a very, I've, as as I, you mentioned earlier, I just came from The New York Times uh, last year, and I can tell you that The Intercept handles uh, material uh, that is sensitive, that comes from sources, as well as any other news organization in the United States, and has a very high standard for the way in which they uh, handle uh, internal security uh, on uh, such sensitive matters, and will continue to do so. Jim, you yourself uh, were subpoenaed, not under the Trump administration, but under the Obama administration. Um, can you just explain your own case? Because even as you were reporting and winning a Pulitzer Prize on uh, covering the Obama administration, they were going after you and how that resolved. Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, I was first subpoenaed uh, by the Bush administration, and then the Obama administration continued it uh, and got new subpoenas. Uh, I was first subpoenaed in a grand jury uh, for a grand jury uh, to testify about sources for a uh, my book, State of War, uh, that came out in 20, 2006. And um, I was subpoenaed in 2008 by the Bush administration to testify for a grand jury. And then the Obama administration uh, renewed that subpoena, and the judge quashed it, they actually quashed two grand jury subpoenas. And then they uh, subpoenaed me to testify at a trial in, uh, later after, uh, uh, in, in that same case. And that tr uh, subpoena was quashed by the judge. But the Obama administration appealed that to uh, the appeals court, in uh, and in their uh, appeal, they they wrote a brief saying that there was no such thing as a reporter's privilege, which meant that they believed there was no legal right for a reporter not to be forced to testify about their sources, and the court of appeals uh, agreed with uh, the Obama administration on that and. Uh, then I took the case to the Supreme Court because uh, to, to and the Supreme Court refused to take the case. And then in uh, 2015, I was uh, I had to appear at a pretrial hearing to determine whether or not I was going to testify or not, and I said I would not. And um, the Obama administration, at the last minute. Uh, backed off and decided not to send me to jail. And so the case ended at that point. And finally, <clears throat> Jim, you just wrote a piece um, this week called, Is Donald Trump Above the Law? 
explain and talk <laughs> about your call for a Trump project. Yeah, I, I, I wrote in this uh, latest piece that, you know, there's this longstanding uh, tradition uh, based partly on legal opinions issued by the Justice Department over the last few decades, in which uh, it's believed that the Justice Department cannot indict and prosecute a sitting president, and that the only uh, available option is impeachment in Congress. But it's clear now that uh, the Republicans in Congress are not going to ever go along with an impeachment, no matter what Robert Mueller and his special counsel find. Uh, even if the Democrats retake the House, and even if they retook the Senate, it's highly unlikely they would have the votes in the Senate for a conviction on an impeachment. And so the only real uh, avenue, I believe, to deal with the criminality of Donald Trump is to uh, indict him and prosecute him in a federal court. Uh, and I think that the uh, the prosecutors, both in, the, in New York, who have dealt with the Cohen matter, uh, and Mueller's special counsel office, should both consider uh, indicting him for what are very obviously criminal activity, uh, criminal matters. And, and you the, think the most the, obvious part of the criminal matters are what? What do you think is criminal? Well, I think this week what we got was uh, Donald Trump's former lawyer, personal lawyer, revealing, admitting in court that he that the fel the felony he just pled guilty to was a conspiracy that he that was coordinated and directed by Donald Trump. He said that in court. That makes it. I mean, how does a federal prosecutor, when you have just prosecuted the man's personal lawyer and that and that personal lawyer has admitted that Trump directed him to do the thing that you just prosecuted him for, how do you then ignore that as a prosecutor? It could well just be whether a pres sitting president can be indicted would go to the Supreme Court. And it's a very serious question about what it would mean yes. if Brett Kavanaugh were sitting on that Supreme Court. Yes, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the the Senate, I don't think, should go forward with his nomination until the, all these things are, are clarified. And how likely do you think that is, that they wouldn't <laughs> move forward? Well, that's a good question. I think the Democrats may have the votes to slow things down on his nomination. Uh, I don't think they'll ever be able to stop it unless they retake the Senate. But I mean, there's a lot of procedural motions, I would think, that they would be able to use to slow it down. The Trump project, but, Jim? Yeah, I, I, I wrote another piece uh, about a week ago about the when every, you know, when the American uh, editorial pages were all writing about uh, the need for press freedom in America. I said that we should really go further than just having a series of uh, editorials. We need to have uh, reporter, investigative reporters come together in a, a joint project to investigate Trump, much the way that investigative reporters came together back in the 1970s in Arizona uh, after investigative reporter Don Bowles was murdered in, in a car bombing by the mob. Uh, about 38 investigative reporters came from all over the country to jointly investigate what Bowles had been investigating and then wrote a series of uh, stories about it. I think well, that's what we need with Donald Trump is to have investigative reporters from every major news organization getting together and writing to get jointly a comprehensive investigation of Trump that could be published in jointly throughout the country as a sign of the how uh, strong uh, press freedom and investigative reporting still is, despite Trump. Well, we're going to end it there, but I do want to go back to our first guest, Billy Winter Davis, and ask that question uh, that people are now asking online after President Trump's tweet. Would you be requesting, would Reality Winner want to request a pardon of President Trump? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Billy. Um, absolutely, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we would want to do whatever we can to undo 
this. Um, her sentence is not fair. Um, the way that she's been treated is not fair. And if President Trump would pardon her, I would be very grateful. Well, and so would she. I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, from, well, where Billy lives, uh, Augusta, Georgia. Sorry, where reality lived before she was arrested. Um, Billy Winter Davis speaking to us from Augusta, Georgia. Kevin Gastola, we're going to link to your pieces, talking to us from Atlanta. And James Risen of The Intercept, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, will link to all your pieces um, related to this case. Uh, this is Democracy. Now, again, reality winner sentenced to 63 months in prison. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, a Bangladeshi woman about to be deported is stopped. The deportation is stopped because of public outcry. Stay with us. Oh, when they try and tell you what you can and can't do Resist when they say what you don't know Tell them to go back to school Resist when they try and tell you Who is and ain't your neighbor Resist when they won't pay you And exploit your labor We want freedom man. Resist by Reverend Seku. Here is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show in Connecticut, where a Bangladeshi woman facing deportation has been granted a last-minute stay following public outcry against her removal. Salma Sikander's deportation was halted less than 24 hours before she was supposed to board a one-way flight to Bangladesh, leaving her husband and 17-year-old son, who's a U.S. citizen. Sikander has lived in the United States for nearly 20 years, but in June she was told by ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, she had to leave the country by August. That's when her community stepped in, staging protests in New Haven, a hunger strike outside ICE office in Hartford, Connecticut, demanding Salma be allowed to stay in the U.S. This is Salma husband, Anwar Mahmoud, speaking to NBC Connecticut shortly after the stay of deportation was announced. If she was leaving, then we have no chance to fight back. Now she's still here, so we can fight. So that's all we need. We need to fight, and we're going to win this fight. For more, we go to Hartford, Connecticut, where we're joined by Salma Sikander herself and her son, Samir. Later today, they'll be heading to Quinnipiac University, where Samir will start his freshman year. It's been her mother's lifelong dream to send her son to college. Welcome to Democracy Now! Salma, let's begin with you. How did this happen, that your deportation was stopped? Community help, go to Who? Bolo. Bolo. The community help. Yeah, is a the community help me, a and a lot of community organization is help me. Um, a lot of uh, the, oh, sorry, a lot of the community helped her out, and uh, there are multiple protests over the protest. uh, Hartford yeah. area, New Haven area, which uh, helped my mother uh, uh, become known to ICE and know, let ICE know that that there are supporters and that they're wrongfully deporting her. Samir, can you talk about the hunger strike led by your father? All right. So the hunger strike was uh, originally an idea I wasn't that okay with because I didn't want people suffering from my mom, so didn't my, my mom either. And so what happened was my dad had a bunch of crazy ideas because he was, he was losing his mind, to be honest, because of the deportation. He was going to lose the love of his life, and he's going to lose my mother. So he thought of having a hunger strike in front of Hartford, in front of ISIS building, where if they look out the window, they see us that for the next 43 hours until the deportation date slash time. And so the hunger strike was led in front of ICE. There were about nine other individuals who joined, and over hundreds of people have joined us, from the South Windsor mayor to the Manchester mayor, even the Hartford mayor himself. And, and Governor Malloy and Senator Blumenthal showed support, Congress, and then yeah, Congresswoman Rosa DeLores showed their support and understood our problem. 
So, uh, Geo Group facilitated. That's the large prison company that um, there was a mass protest against all over the country weeks ago. Um, but they facilitated um, your mom, Salma Sikander, uh, from uh, wearing an ankle bracelet since what? An ankle monitor since June. They took that monitor off yesterday. Explain what's all happened, Samir, uh, in this week. How this changed? Why I said they were deporting her after she lived here for 20 years, and then just the developments of this week. So what, what happened was, uh, on Monday, we uh, had our press conference with Rosa DeLore, and she started bawling her eyes out, because she read our story, and she heard everything that this mother, who is actually being wrongfully deported, is being wrongfully deported. She has no crime. She has nothing. And so Rosa DeLore started crying, and she, act, she asked ICE personally called them and asked them to grant my mother's stay or, and, or consider having a stay. And so what happened on Tuesday was the beginning of the hunger strike in front of ICE, my dad and nine other people. Uh, and then hundreds of supporters came out to Hartford to uh, go visit the GEO Group's uh, ISAP office down the street. And they started to protest there. And then at 9 o'clock, at, at uh, 2 o'clock, sorry, or 3 o'clock, sorry, uh, they staged in front of uh, ice and started pulling tents. They started uh, grabbing signs. They started. They started their hunger strike basically. So 20 hours later, we got a um, notice from the Board of Immigrations that my mother's denial got, uh, my mother's uh, stay order got denied. And so we were about to lose hope. And so for the next two, and it was time our our lawyers and everybody we knew advised us to maybe talk about sanctuary. And so what happened was, as we were about to talk about sanctuary and we were about to finalize the moment, uh, we got a call from Congresswoman Delores' office saying that ICE is making something is going on inside of ICE's building, that uh, ICE is considering my mom's case now. The chief of ICE that is in that building behind us is looking into our case. And so I let everybody know the hunger strike and the news medias, and they were all they were all static, but we didn't know how long that was going to be. So about 22 an hour later, we got the call from our lawyer and said that ICE has granted the stay for officially a year, which can be renewed. And so the, after that, my mom just had tears of joy, and she started crying, and my dad just started crying like a baby. I'd never seen him cry like that. And so I guess ICE looked at, looked at us, and I think—and I again, I thank ICE for uh, looking at my mother, looking at us, and not, not deporting my mother, who deserves to be in this country with me. Salma, it was your lifelong dream to take Samir to college, um, first generation, to come to, co to be here. Um, it wasn't clear you would be at his side, but now you will be taking him to Quinnipiac today. How does that feel? Ma'am, actually, this is my long life dream. My son is going to Quinnipiac University, it's a very good university. So I'm feeling very good, and she's start to Monday to college. So I'm very happy. And Samir, um, it's pretty stressful to start college and also exciting. And you, it's further you are stressed by the idea that you are losing your mother. Now she will be your side, taking you to school today. How do you feel? I feel I feel relieved because uh, I got knocked into the political world without even knowing about it and trying for the last month. I've I've met with ven uh, various politicians, various supporters, and I want to thank everybody. And there was also a petition. I want to thank the forty three thousand people that signed that petition to keep Salma home slash keep my mom home. So after all, I feel like the hard work paid off and. I know this is not the end, or the, and this is just the beginning of what's going to happen in the future, but I'm just relieved that on the first day of school we can keep the tr tradition going of me and my mom dropping me off in front of everybody and embarrassing me. <laughs> well, Salma Sikander and Samir Mahmoud, congratulations. And Samir, have a great Thank year you. at Quinnipiac. I want to wish Vesta Godars a happy birthday. That does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Nermeen Sheikh, I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.